Ladies and gentlemen, it's another episode of Prototype, and it's another one with an exclamation Todd at the end. Titans walk among us indeed, because as you can see on your screen, this is the time of the new Goliath graphic. Solstice has finally delivered us from the lard one, which was rendered with perspective, kind of like the scout graphic. So really happy to see that no longer in the game. And uh, I mean, admittedly, this shot could have shown off more facing angles or whatever. This is actually a screenshot taken from some TVT practice that Benno and I were doing just yesterday on the 26th. And today, of course, it is the 27th. It is Wednesday. I am recording this at about 530 in the afternoon. I think it still technically qualifies as afternoon. And after this, I'll be uh, doing a cast over and then hopping on stream to get some melee mapping done. But let's talk a little bit about what we're going to be talking about in this episode, right? Not only is there a new Goliath here, there's also a new Crash Course. Oh, that's the micro video that I was able to put out recently. And that one actually garnered a little bit more attention than the macro one, maybe because it's a little bit easier to just compare and contrast how clunky StarCraft's movements are compared to CMBW's and how the order processing is, you know, really jank and... Oh, all this other stuff. So I do feel like some of the uh, examples and some of the, you know, comparison shots and stuff were probably, you know, they make for a little bit more, you know, better video looking at, you know, better examples or whatever. I think that's pretty good, pretty obvious. There are some things that in retrospect, I could have done better with that video, but generally speaking, it's uh, it's cool. It's nice to see that that uh, video is gathering the attention uh, that, you know, really helping to put the project on the map for some people, I think. And, and that's just the nature of these Crash Course videos, right? I mean, they do exist as a way to introduce people to some of the concepts and get people acquainted with some of the changes so that they can kind of know what they're getting into if they check the project out. But I think they also work in a context of like providing you some idea of that this project is pretty ambitious and it may, you know, it aims to change a lot of things. So even if you don't end up playing it, you might know about it and then maybe you recommend it or at least, you know, the, I guess there's this marketing aids term. I actually forget. I think it's mind share, right? It's like, if I just increase awareness of this project, with enough of these videos, eventually somebody might see, you know, it's sort of the same way that on YouTube, if you see the same recommended video, like, okay, I'll give you a personal example. There's something that I've just refused to click on because it's actually not really that interesting to me, but I haven't dismissed it. So it just keeps like coming back under other videos of the similar length where it's like some video about the like discrepancies between different scientific researches on the fossil record. I think that's what it is. Honestly, it's kind of telling that even though I've seen it a hundred times, probably I can't actually tell you what the video is, but it was something about that. It's like all oh, the fossil record and our scientific notes on it are like, you know, it's not, not exactly accurate or something is like supposed to be the thrust of the video. And I've seen it recommended so many times. And I guess the idea behind YouTube is that eventually I'll just be like, fuck, fine. I watched this video. Stop putting it in front of me. Jesus. But I actually don't work like that. Like, I don't care. <laughs> I'll just continue to not click on it. But maybe some other people are like, oh my God, what is Cosmonarchy Broodwar? I keep hearing about it all over the place. Fine, I'll check it out. And like, but maybe not with as much, you know, venom as uh, my delivery there might ent entail or imply. So maybe they'll just be like genuinely, you know, finally they cave in and, and click or whatever. And it's like a good thing instead of it being a bad thing. I don't know. But uh, a lot of people are checking out the project now. You know, we've had a couple of new people, fresh faces, uh, pop into the server and download the project and give some impressions. Uh, there's Redmond, there's uh, Green Eggs and Spam. I like that name. Uh, and then there's a couple of people who have checked it out, but maybe they haven't posted anything about it, but they've, you know, checked out the project for the purposes of, you know, just like trying it out on their own and maybe they'll play it with some friends or maybe they'll just play the campaign or whatever. Uh, it, it's actually been really nice that there is a campaign, even though it's kind of old. And Night of the Realm did us a solid by making a couple of missions of a campaign for people to check out because without that, I feel like I would just be like, yeah, you got to play against the AI in these scenario maps or melee maps. And for whatever reason, that's just not as compelling as like following a narrative or whatever. And it's fully voice acted and blah, blah, blah. So I feel like that's pretty cool. You know, uh, at the very least, there is that. So like, honestly, I've been thinking about that in the general, like the broad sense of the word. And it's like, maybe it's a good idea if we also make like a four map long campaign. I mean, ideally... Uh, Butcher's Ballad would have been set in Cresilient instead of in the old world, you know, because uh, it's like a classic setting campaign. Uh, and so it doesn't, it probably gives the people the wrong idea of what CMBW's lore is going to be like, because it's actually just like CMBW tech trees, but inside the, you know, original StarCraft 1 setting. 
uh, with, you know, Manx and the Dominion and Rainer and all this other stuff. So uh, that's not at all what we're going to be doing with our work. So maybe we should, you know, hurry up and replace that with something like Day of Blood. Uh, and by replace, I don't mean like decommission it, but like put it in a specific folder that says like classic setting or something, you know, so that people have a, a better idea of what's up without having to navigate uh, you know, to the website to find that information out. Cause I feel like 90% of people are just going to play the maps and not check out the documentation on the website or whatever. So anyway, that's like its own thing, but maybe we just make like a quick couple map campaign, you know, for each race. And then at least we have that. I mean, that's kind of what the uh, tutorials are supposed to be initially. And now it's just probably going to be like, well, I'll stick to one mission per race and then sort of scale up from there if need be, because it's more important that we get something for all the races than anything else. So that's just one of the things that I've been musing on, but definitely something that like I appreciate out of the realm, man, because without him contributing in that sense, I feel like we would have been in a, a bit of an awkward position where it's like now we, we have no single player content for those who are minded towards that ang that end, right? Uh, and it's it's actually pretty interesting because a lot of people who are checking us out also happen to be, you know, stream watchers or something like they follow the streams and the gameplay of professionals and amateurs in the foreign brood war scene and maybe also in the Korean scene. Like they might watch a lot of ASL or whatever, right? And to me, I, I think that it's kind of funny because a lot of them are also like, I'm actually really bad at StarCraft, but you know, I just like watching the good players or whatever. Uh, so that's been the sort of idea so far. Uh, but then we have people like Keen checking us out for the tournament that's coming up. And that to me feels like, oh, that's pretty cool. Because like if, if he, who obviously has played at a relatively high level in terms of default StarCraft, gets a, a taste of CMBW and then is like, holy shit, I like this way better or whatever. Like who knows what he actually thinks. But if that were to be the case, like if we put our best foot forward there and everything runs smoothly and everything feels good, then suddenly it's like, oh, well maybe we, he can be like one of the guys who, you know, tells two friends who tell two friends, et cetera. And we get to a point where, you know, the, the friends that are being told or the acquaintances that are being told about this project suddenly are like higher skill players. They can start joining, contributing, competing and level up our, all of our skill because we're constantly facing off against them. So that would that would seem to me like a pretty cool idea anyway. So I don't know if it's going to go out, go down exactly like that, but it's it's a cool idea. So anyway, that was a big long intro uh, where I covered a bunch of different things that I was thinking about. And now let's talk about some more specific things. So the Goliath is not the only new exciting thing that we're going to be deploying within Ascension 5 this Saturday, the 30th of September. We are also going to be deploying height extension with, you know, assuming everything works out super well. And what is the height extension exactly? Well, uh, Dark and Fantasies, the man, the myth, the legend has successfully made managed to uh, create this parallel mini tile system where basically the the tile sets of StarCraft have flags that you paint over each individual tile. And those flags determine things like, is the tile pathable? And where is the tile pathable? That, that way you can have like partial pathability of a specific tile where it's only unwalkable in certain areas. Uh, buildability is done in a tile by tile basis, but the walkability is a little bit more granular. And then there's also height for the same thing. So he has a parallel system that basically adds to the height where you look at that and you think to yourself, okay, what does that exactly mean? That means we can suddenly have up to, I think 256 was the total number of unique height levels where previously we only had three because three. I mean, why, why would you need any more than three? That's what Blizzard thinks. Well, we're not gonna use all that many. Uh, most likely we're gonna have one or two negative height levels, which is going to basically be for like Swamp on Boscovine. If people have played that map or seen that map, they know Swamp exactly, uh, and, then, and the Sunken Jungle as well. They do not have uh, the same level of height, right? They have, they rather, they are the same level of height as like base jungle. So that is actually a little bit, you know, you wouldn't look at that and think, oh, that makes sense. It's like, no, actually they should instead provide good, uh, you know, value in terms of height, but we just don't have, didn't have the technology. So that map ended up being, never really being able to succeed to its like fullest extent, right? It was never as defensible as it was probably supposed to be. Uh, sieging the map was a little bit easier onto the low ground when they take that gas heavy, you know, third or fourth or whatever, depending on where they take it and, and when. Um, and stuff like that was just never exactly the vision of the beaver. Uh, so now the, the map maker, the beaver 99, it, you know, it, once I plug in these changes and such, uh, which we just finished uh, earlier today, uh, we should be able to, you know, actually do the tile set specific changes now. And we'll probably have to add a couple of extra tiles to like, uh, I'm thinking the central tiles will probably need to need some adjustments because we're going to need uh, to take the version of swamp that blends with sunken jungle and make it minus two height so that there's a height transition from sunken jungle down to swamp. Whereas if you're just going from base jungle down to swamp, that should just be one height. So we're going to need to like add a couple of things in there to support that. But, you know, I should be able to 
wrangle all of that, and then implement that for all of the existing competitive maps, including Boscovine, which is actually maybe um, not so fortuitously timing-wise, is actually being subbed out of Ascension 5. At least that's the plan. I'm planning on retiring Boscovine, but we'll see if we don't have a, a suitable map to replace it, right? Uh, that's another concern. I'm actually going to be streaming map making later today for that exact purpose, by the way. So I guess you can uh, keep your eyes peeled. Maybe there's going to be some new maps in the needs testing folder. Uh, so there is that. Uh, but yeah, generally speaking, having access to stuff like that, you guys may know the uh, StarCraft map Nemesis, which is a really shitty uh, map set on the Twilight tile set, which is like where Shakuras was in the campaigns and stuff. Uh, that one has the flagstone tile type and like the crushed rock and stuff. I mean, I'm using names that people will know from the editor, but if you don't know, then you don't know what I'm talking about. But basically that blue nighttime tile set or whatever um, has the sunken ground tile type that is not a height advantage or disadvantage. So you actually don't have, uh, I mean, in StarCraft 1, you have mischance, which is super, super aids, but you don't have any height advantage attacking into the base. Um, and I think that's probably one of the only reasons why that map is playable, but I wouldn't even really call it playable because when you block off all the pathing and your units just tiz out instead of actually moving anywhere, <laughs> <laughs> well, that's not really what I would like out of my game. So unsurprisingly, I look at that and think that's stupid. Um, anyway, the bulk of what I'm getting at here is that we'll be able to take stuff like that and make that tile type and actually a, a height disadvantage so that when you use it in maps, uh, uh, like the on the ice tile set, the actual ice tile that you can build on in CMBW but couldn't build on in StarCraft 1, uh, is a, an example of something that is clearly like a dip in the terrain but does not actually you know, provide a height penalty. So you can see above it and below it, like there's no vision loss, there's no cliff advantage in CMBW. Well, that will change once we get this wrangled, right? So there's a couple of more things that we need to at least investigate. And, and you know, we all obviously have to apply these new flags to all of the tiles that we need to for the purposes of X height and uh, the extra height stuff, uh, the extended height, I guess you could say. And the other thing to point out too, is that this will allow us to add height to things. It's not just negative height, but in theory, we could have, you know, height when we stack up the cliffs and stuff. Now, the the, the reason why I say in theory is because we are still limited in tile, tile set uh, group size. DF hasn't really worked on that yet or at all, and I'm not sure if he has plans to. So that would be one example where if we could extend that, then that would allow us to have bigger tile sets so that we could add more to jungle, where for the longest time we haven't been able to add anything to jungle, and it's been quite frustrating. Um, so that would be one example of if we can do that, then we can start to add like, you know, before it was uh, dirt, high dirt, highest dirt. Well, now there would be highest -er dirt or something <laughs> for the for the fourth level or something. Uh, and then that cliff stacking would actually provide you with some height level stuff. Um, eventually it would still reach a conclusion, but at the very least it would be worth, uh, you know, looking at as far as, you know, because we would need to change the color and stuff, and you can't just do that arbitrarily like in Antikythera, our own engine that we're eventually going to be using for stuff like this uh, without needing to have custom tiles for every single version of everything. Uh, the tile layering in Antikythera is way better for map makers and uh, obviously doesn't require you to manually place all the tiles in the first place, but you know, maybe SEM draft source code will eventually be given to us, but uh, until that happens, I'm not holding my breath, right? I'm, I'm not gonna bother with anything like that, so. Uh, but yeah, so height extension is really exciting. And I don't know if I did a great job explaining why it's very exciting, but the long and short TLDR is check out maps like Boscovine, uh, tile sets like Ice and Twilight or, or Desert with the uh, Sandy Sunken Pit tile type, anything like that that has those sunken sort of subterranean cliffs, they will start to provide height penalties now. Therefore, when you're above them, you can get the cliff advantage. That's obviously pretty exciting because it's just more accurate gameplay communication and provides map makers more, a more varied suite of tools for creating interesting visuals that still provide consistent and, uh, you know, sensible, I guess, intuitive uh, gameplay. So there's that for sure. And then obviously on the flip side, we could increase the height for things like mountainous maps, uh, assuming we end up having the ability to add tiles to those kinds of tile sets, which uh, some, of, some of the tile sets are like jungles completely full. And I can't remember what the next in line for that is. It's probably Badlands, uh, but it, you can still add a couple of things to Badlands. So maybe we'll see that. And that's exciting stuff. So I wanted to note that. I guess Space Platform is probably the next in line too. Uh, not in terms of max tiles, but I have a bunch of, because 
So Space Platform, just as a bit of an aside, is a really weird tile set because Platform, which is the, the base tile that you see most often, is not low height, it's actually medium height because Low Platform, which is the brown platform tile that has like the really messed up looking cliffs, um, that one is actually, that is a height disadvantage. It's like the only tile set that started off with the height, the low, like things like Rusty Pit and Low Platform which are the, the sunken in tiles, it's the only one where that actually is a height disadvantage. Whereas everything else started off with like, you know, just the, the base height level basically for things like jungle or dirt or whatever. Um, so those tiles actually do provide a height disadvantage. Therefore high platform, which is the, the default cliff you could say um, that blends with uh, the base tile layer, that one works as a tier three height, whereas like low platforms tier one, and then the middle one is just like medium is like height level two, right? So height level three is high platform. And then I modded in the ability to stack platform on top of itself to make higher platform or whatever, but it never provided a cliff advantage, even though like compared to all the other tile sets, you would think it would. Uh, the platform is the only tile set that didn't have this, right? So actually space platform will probably see a nice improvement there. Although again, I'm gonna have to like, tint shift the uh, base tile and stuff so that you actually see a visual distinction to indicate, yeah, by the way, this is actually a height disadvantage or advantage depending on which angle you're going at. So some more graphical work will need to be done to fully make this feel finalized, but I think it's definitely gonna be worth it and I'm very excited for the ability to do that. So shout out to DF for once again, adding something really significant, right? He's selection extender guy, entity limit extender guy. Obviously he provided us with the diadem and the phalanx and a bunch of other stuff. Now he's provided us with height extension and I'm sure I'm missing a bunch of things. Obviously the vestry is another asset of his, uh, but yet, you know, I'm, I'm sure I'm missing other things that he's contributed uh, to the project in recent history. Uh, but anyway, shout out to him, he's a cool guy. So there is going to be some forthcoming Cosmonarchy Brood War video content that I wanted to cover here. And that is essentially uh, the Ascension Explainer is coming up next. Obviously we did just drop the crash course for Micro a couple days ago. Uh, and before that, I guess uh, as a, another sort of like video-ish content thing that I should probably uh, point out is I did do a little over three hours with none other than Ross Scott of Accursed Farms. Uh, that video is on his secondary channel. Uh, so there's not a huge amount of um, views or, or, you know, responses or whatever, but there's some, uh, you know, if you wanted to see what I had to say, sort of how I represented the community and stuff, I will uh, go ahead and link, leave a link. Uh, unfortunately, there was something there where there was a, a bit of like a, I thought I was doing a pretty good job of explaining how to connect the concept of enemy or uh, I guess entities, it doesn't have to be enemies. Like if you imagine an uh, a RPG game like Skyrim or whatever, like one of these open world games, I thought I did a good job of, of connecting the idea that like the entities within these games really make the world meaningful. And without the uh, world being meaningful, and uh, you know that they, if you don't have compelling entities that make up the world, then your whole world falls apart and you can't really enjoy it. But it didn't seem like he agreed with that base preposition or proposition and I never, I guess I probably could have stated that base proposition better, be, or at least like we could have had a longer back and forth about that specifically. But uh, yeah, I'm not really 100% sure what I could have done better yet because I haven't gone back and watched it because it is a very long conversation. Uh, but at some point, I'll probably take a, a l listen to that and see in my head, um, you know, what could we do uh, like what, what, how could I like present my ideas a little bit better, but I appreciated the opportunity to kind of go into, I guess, a more casual space or normal space of, uh, you know, in a way that his audience is a little bit on the hardcore side, but they don't have our views as a community of like what makes a good product or, you know, what, what's good about like engagement and like how com competition and the game competing for your time and like challenging you to be better is like a really good thing. And we should always chase that. Um, they don't really have our abilities to, or, or our sensibilities, I guess I should say, to do that, right? Um, th that's a case where it's like, I, I appreciate the idea of being able to communicate to a, a person like that and then like, you know, have my ideas proliferate in that environment and then see what happens because maybe I'm off base, but uh, maybe it's just like, this is how I can communicate better in the future. So all of that stuff is really cool. Anyway, as I, after that, like the next day, I was able to finalize and release the micro video. And then now here we are a couple days later and I've already started work on the Ascension Explainer. So the script and the narration is completely done for that. So really all I have to do is start plugging the script into Vegas, which I'm still using to edit because I, I was actually gonna try to use uh, Premiere to edit, but 
I need to watch like a how to use Premiere basic shit guide at some point uh, since the control scheme is completely different from Vegas and the layout is completely different too. At least it feels like it. So we'll see about that one. You know, uh, maybe that might be something to look at later on. Because like, I, I don't mind paying a short penalty at some point, maybe when I'm not tr on such a, an extreme schedule um, to like learn a new tool or whatever, and then go from there to, uh, you know, Maybe that will improve the pipeline for videos in the future because maybe Premiere is actually better than Vegas. But I'm also using old versions of both of these programs and I don't think it's a good idea to try to get any newer versions either. So uh, yeah, I, I don't know. We'll see about that. Maybe if there are any people who have a, a decent amount of experience with video editing software and they have like their own preferences, they can post which one they like best and then like what they like about it. And then I can use that information to fuel my own decisions about you know, which program I go forward with. Maybe there's like a, like DaVinci Resolve I've heard about from uh, 3Crow, but I don't think he uses it anymore or at all. I, I don't know. He, he was using it for a time. Um, but anyway, all of this is to say, uh, yeah, I think it's pretty, uh, it's an, it's a good idea anyway, for me to maybe try to learn a different one, uh, similar to how like going from, you know, I imagine that if somebody was really used to 3ds max and then they moved to blender, Maybe it makes sense to move to Blender long term, even though it's a short term penalty to your ability to play uh, or to, to, you know, edit models or whatever, right? To like actually play around with your tools and make stuff. So I'm kind of thinking of it in the same way. But anyway, um, the Ascension Explainer will be the next video that is hopefully going to come out before Ascension 5, just to clear up a lot of the rules and stuff. Uh, I'm going to be working on that after my stream tonight. And then, you know, I hope that basically the, the hardest part for me for any of these videos is always like getting started. So I hope that I can at least settle on like an intro that I'm relatively happy with and then, you know, see where we go from there. I actually just realized that I was planning on titling this the, uh, the crash course for the Ascension tournaments. And I don't think think I, yeah, I didn't record a part where I said, welcome to the Ascension crash course. And I did that for like the macro and the micro. So I'm gonna have to like ADR that in or whatever at some point. Um, but yeah, we'll see about what happens after that. Uh, so yeah, anyway, the uh, future forthcoming video content out after the Ascension explainer video and as a result, after at the very least group stage of Ascension 5 is going to cover the crash courses of the races. So I'm gonna do like one video per race basically. This is where I'll get into talking about uh, things like corpse consumption being a global sort of mechanic. And then, um, you know, after these crash courses are done, I think we can go back to doing roster profiles. We haven't done one since the didact. So that would definitely make sense. Obviously I've also been waiting for like, in my head, I'd like to showcase, you know, the units with our own bespoke assets that have made it through the ringer as far as visuals are concerned. Uh, but up until recently, the Cyclops looked like it was final and then Solstice made some adjustments to that. So, you know, at some point I just have to pull the trigger and say, even if we don't have like a custom Maverick graphic, because I do want a custom Maverick graphic so that it's not like, you know, changing which angle, of, which hand it's holding its uh, rifle in, depending on, you know, is it left or right <laughs> facing? <laughs> it's really stupid because they just flip the, the frames, right? Um, so that that's the kind of thing that I would like to not bother with. Um, but anyway, like, yeah, maybe I should just not wait for that. And maybe I should just get, get it going, right? So we'll see what, what the state of the assets are after the crash courses for each race have been done. I suspect I'll probably finish those within the first, like maybe by my birthday, my birthday is the 13th of October. So like, hopefully I'll be done or putting the finishing touches on the last racial crash course, uh, for, uh, CMBW by then, uh, so that I can say like the rest of October can be dedicated to, you know, the in-game tutorial missions and maybe some, some roster, like a roster profile before the end of the month or something like that. Right. Uh, that seems like it would be a good idea. Anyway, uh, the other stuff to comment on here is just that I did release a poll. I guess I can take a look at that poll. Uh, of course, the primer video for a uh, CMBW was the thing that won out pretty dominantly here. Um, yeah. So, uh, after I finished race specific crash course videos, what should I focus development efforts on? And this was basically like, what does the the populace, the voting public, uh, think that I should you know focus on? What do they want to see the most, or what do they think would be the most useful, right? And uh, the first option, which did win pretty heavily, it's actually one percent off sixty nine, sixty eight percent, says a primer video that introduces CMBW from top to bottom. 
And that would basically be like, what is Cosmonarchy Brood War? What are our visions for Cosmonarchy Brood War? Like, what's our vision for the project and what do we want out of it? And what, you know, not necessarily what inspired us to make it, but like, what is the project's ethos and what is it trying to accomplish? As well as, you know, maybe like, broad strokes kinds of video. This would probably be a fairly lengthy one compared to the crash courses. Like it'd probably be at least 15 minutes long. Uh, and that is fairly lengthy when you consider all the editing that goes into these videos. So yeah, that's definitely something to think in, uh, keep in mind. Uh, the second option in the poll, which is the second most voted, which is 29% says tutorial missions, one for each race. Obviously this is something that I do want to accomplish. I'm just not sure it would be the most useful for the project, sort of um, pro proliferating the project across the consciousness of uh, the like foreign brood war scene, for example, or, or whatever. Um, funnily enough, the Starcraft subreddit didn't really care too much. Like the Starcraft subreddit is mostly Starcraft too. Uh, that subreddit did not care at all about the macro video, but they heavily upvoted the micro one, probably because I titled it as we made Starcraft, we made brood war more responsive, something like that. <laughs> and they were like, Oh my God, what? And so that's funny because that's almost like, I, I think more responsiveness means, uh, okay, so I watch a lot of StarCraft streams still, and when I'm watching these streams, I see people like, you know, getting proxy gate zealoted on the ladder, and they're Terran, and they have the uh, Marines that they're running back and forth, and just the delay on their units acquiring a, an attack target on attack move or whatever is like so agonizing, particularly considering like if you try to right click, you might issue a move command, right? So you can't like force target. I mean, I guess you can hit like a left click and then hopefully your mouse is on the target, right? Uh, but it's just like, uh, that is so silly to me. Like that is so ridiculous. So yeah, I, I don't know, man. I think that's really weird. Um, and I feel like you don't, you don't really, like the fact that you, there's just not this ability to be precise and your units are not very responsive, to me, makes the game worse. And some people will maybe argue that this makes the game like higher skill because if you are able to like force target enemies with a right click, that makes your units more responsive than if you attack move. And obviously it gives you better target selection. But I don't really see why your unit should have this like you know, innate gimping factor that, uh, like this innate handicap basically, uh, that prevents it from doing basic things. Right. So anyway, like that's the kind of thing that when I watch these videos, I think to myself, like, dude, isn't it so much better that we have, you know, the ability to just have, uh, have responsive units. Uh, so anyway, when I, when I phrased it that way, uh, on the subreddit, I was thinking like some people are going to interpret this as we made the game easier, but really what I'm saying is we made the game's skill ceiling higher in my opinion, like in that particular context, I want to see, you know, something equivalent to Muta micro from somebody like Jadong in CMBW because uh, you know, like he, he was helping to redefine like how good mutas could actually be in that matchup way back. Like now imagine, uh, okay. Like one example of this, right. Is that they in remastered they unlocked a turn rate setting that didn't used to exist in StarCraft 1. You had like the latencies which were, you know, low, high and extra high. And they basically unlocked something equivalent to extra low if you want to call it that. So that your units responded a little bit snappier. And since then there has been a meta shift at top level StarCraft where, you know, you can do more with stuff like Mutamicro. With CMBW, you're basically saying that like it's it's even less. I mean, it's not latency because it's not really like that, but your units are even more responsive and it's following the same idea of like, if I can get to that extra low latency, I don't remember what the turn rate number is exactly, but it's like, if I can do that with like extra low latency and then that gives me more of a skill cap for like how precise I can be and how responsive my units are, surely making the units more responsive from the back end, like in a code level is actually a good thing too from that you know extent. Unless maybe there's like a nuanced argument that says your units should o only be so responsive. They shouldn't be mega responsive. And if you're wondering what that background sound is, that's somebody who thinks it's really cool to drive around and then park because they're in traffic with their radio blaring at max volume. Uh, I believe the setting for that, vo the volume setting there is probably Windows Shatter. Um, yeah, so uh, good job there, buddy. Anyway, uh, that is one of the things that I've thought about, right? It's like, what if we had the capacity to play around with units even more responsibly? Uh, so that's sort of like what I was thinking when I said we made Brood War more responsive. And I feel like the average person on that particular subreddit, which is more casual and is definitely geared more towards StarCraft 2, was probably thinking, we made Brood War not stupid, LOL. Even though I think obviously Brood War is way better than StarCraft 2. So. It's just funny to me. It's funny.
so yeah, there's some top topics I'm talking about the video content that's coming out and that is planned. Again, the very next video will be an explainer for Ascension and hopefully I can bang it out before Ascension 5. So let's talk about Ascension 5 because boy, do I have a tournament coming up for you. Ascension 5 is actually gonna have some updates to it. I did talk about the uh, maps that I'm gonna try to sub out. Like I mentioned earlier, we might not have the ability to actively sub out all of those maps. The only one that I've subbed out so far is uh, Equilibrium for ex -Sidu. And that is something that I'm, uh, I think that's fine. You know, uh, eventually, yeah, I'd like to remove Death Spiral and replace it with something else, but maybe I can like update the map to make it a little bit better for what I'm hoping it will be uh, in the future. Uh, you know, like short-term solution here would be to update some of the maps that I was planning on taking out. And the only other two maps that I wanted to take out at this point were Boscovine and Death Spiral, right? So like maybe we take a look at changing those in a way. Like maybe the Boscovine up, the tile set updates might be enough for Boscovine. Uh, but the, again, the only reason I'm not immediately pulling the trigger is because I just don't have like a map, you know, a latent map waiting to jump in and replace it. Uh, there was a new map from Veek uh, called Thin Ice. And beyond Thin Ice, there's another new map from Veek called Pendulum. And Pendulum actually reminds me of a StarCraft II map that was famous or maybe infamous for having a lot of air cheeses because you had left to right spawns just like in Pendulum. And it's basically like you start in the top left-ish, your opponent starts in the top right-ish. There's a base that in the StarCraft II map that I'm thinking of that I don't remember the name. It was like Eyes of something maybe. Um, Eyes of fucking Zelnaga, who, who knows, dude? Uh, but the the idea behind the map, anyway, it seemed like was, here's some rocks that you can, or no, minerals you can mine to open up a, uh, an opportunity to like get a side flank in or something. A uh, very Brood War-esque in that respect. And then they had the, uh, that side flank led to a safe, an otherwise very safe natural. So in Pendulum, there is no ground path that you can open up with minerals. Instead, it's just an, like, it's basically an island base, but you have a ramp into it from your main. So it's a fairly safe base. Uh, however, you can imagine that, that that would encourage drops. So I don't, you know, I think the map is probably going to be a, you know, a situation where you, you I would imagine you're going to see some pretty cool things in that map. Um, however, I'm not sure that I would put it into the map pool because we already have Repulsion, which is already our platform map you could think of. Uh, however, I'm not above like saying, okay, we're going to have repeats. It's just maps like Repulsion and, Pla and uh, Penum uh, Penumbra, uh, Pendulum, they don't really have uh, anything that says, hey, this is a modded tile set. Like they have the new ramps, right? But I'd really like something that a little bit flashy and showy uh, that would be really cool. Uh, so yeah, I don't think you can really update either of the maps to really be that way either. So uh, to me, it's just like one of those things where it's like, well, if we throw it in there, we're kind of making a concession on visuals, which I would be fine doing if that's like push came to shove. But ideally we can have really, really amazing maps that are all visually very distinct and all visually very flashy. And by flashy, I mean, obviously modded, you know? Uh, so that's sort of what I'm getting at anyway. Nightfall is another one of those maps that, uh, again, by Veek, there's very, I don't, there might not be a single custom tile placed on that aside from the ramps. And on the one hand, that's fine for like getting a prototype map out there or whatever. On the other hand, again, I would really like it if the competitive maps had something that called to attention that this is modified. And you know, what are the really obvious ways to do that? Uh, on the ice tile set, it's using the coastal snow because that's a completely new tile type. On the jungle tile set, that's swamp because that's also a, com I mean, it's, I'd say completely new, might be a bit of a stretch, but I mean, like in the same way that the coastal snow blends with water and the water is the old tile. I mean, like the, the swamp is blending with uh, raised jungle cliff. So it's like maybe not as new or whatever, not as completely custom, but it's still very obviously custom. And the fact that you can walk in it and build in it is really cool, even though that we don't have like the overlays and stuff for, you know, treading water and all that shit. Um, not yet anyway. I don't know if we'll even explore that later, but that's definitely something. Uh, yeah, so that would be cool to show off. Anyway, that's one of the reasons why I really like Boscovine. I think it's a reasonable competitive map as well. Uh, and maybe it'll be an even better competitive map once we make these extended height changes. But I also think it's kind of run its course. And uh, I, I don't know, like I don't look at statistics for like how, what, you know, what percentage of times do people ban this map? What percentage of times do people pick this map or play on this map to, at all? Because I feel like we're pretty far away from having a, like a, uh, large number of players who compete with each other in terms of like providing close matches. And again, I didn't say good matches there. It's like, I don't really care about your rating per se, but it's like, you know, Shambler and Ablime, 
uh, missed seem all pretty, you know, competitive with each other in that sense. Uh, I, th- I imagine Keen will uh, emerge as at the very least a contender with that four, the, the, with the other three. Uh, but you know, it really depends on how often he plays and uh, you know, how much practice he has. So I'm not hundred percent sure on that one. But anyway, um, there's some thoughts that I have about things like that, where I'm wondering if it wouldn't make some sense to, you know, like wait until we have a more competitive uh, player base in like that can just compete amongst each other. And that way we can determine like, okay, you know, is this one map really obviously Imba or is this one map, you know, not providing good games. And then based on that, that could be an opportunity for me to think about pulling it for those reasons. But for now, I feel like we're probably in the, in the clear, like, I'm not really unhappy with the maps that I have chosen. Uh, I just need to see if I can bang out some good ones uh, in the meantime, I am going to try to make some very standard ones so that if they do end up making it into the map pool on sh- such short notice where they haven't really been exhaustively, I wouldn't say tested, but it's more like, even if you test it like two or three days before the tournament starts, it's still two or three days before the tournament starts and most people haven't seen it. So ideally all of the competitors will find time to play on all the maps or at least see them. Um, but if the new maps are coming in and they're very avant-garde with their uh, layout, then that can make it harder for you to instantaneously understand where things are. So I think that would be one example of like, yeah, let's just go ahead and make some standard maps. And also because I'd like another four spawn map uh, to go along with Nitro Valley. I think that would be a good idea. So anyhow, uh, the format updates are what most people are probably gonna be a little bit more interested in. So the group stage is gonna go exactly like it was before. Uh, We might try to consolidate the streams, whereas, In the past, we would take like uh, a break between each stream. What we might do is after say group A is done, we might check with the group B players and see if they're all available to start group B right then and there, like after maybe a five to 10 minute break between them. And then we might just start it. Uh, If that is possible, then it would be ideal to have like a break between B and C. And then, so we would do groups A and B in one stream and then group, uh, group C and D in the other. That's just to reduce the whole total number of streams that we have to, and VODs and stuff uh, to make it a little bit more consolidated. I think that's fine. Uh, and then on playoffs, this is where we're actually going to do a format change. So we are going to go into double elimination for playoffs. And that means that we're going from five series to, oh man, what was the number? I think it was 11 series because you have to play uh, more games. You have to do like the whole lower bracket. I mean, if it wasn't double elim then you would still have more games, more series anyway, because you have more competitors. You have eight competitors instead of six. So you have four quarterfinals, uh, and then you have the two semifinals, which is, and then you have the grand final. So that's seven. But I think we're going from seven to uh, maybe more than 11. Maybe it's like 13 or something. I do have the, bra- the uh, a faux bracket that I came up with just for the purposes of seeing this. Yeah, okay. It looks like we have 14 matches guaranteed. Uh, so the quarterfinals is basically the same as before, where um, you ha- since you have eight competitors, top seed and of each group gets sorted into the quarterfinals, like in a separate quarterfinals, and then they meet the bottom seed. And based on seeding, say Mystery Meat looks like the best player, uh, you know, he, he might have first seed into the playoffs. So then he plays the worst, uh, like the eighth seed player, which would be the, the worst quarterfinalist, uh, the f- worst second place from each, from one of the groups or whatever. Right. And we just sort of sort through there that way. But in the, uh, in the event of, you know, whoever loses that quarterfinal matchup, they drop down to the loser's bracket and they get one more chance. Uh, well, like basically they have, they've lost one of their two tournament lives and we go all the way to the grand final and the grand final might end up being a best of seven instead of best of five. Uh, but if we do that, we have to consider what we're doing about the, uh, map pool stuff. Cause it's like, do you want to ban one map uh, versus pick the starter? Cause like we only have eight maps, right? So if we're going to do a best of seven, then that would have to be something like that. Uh, where you can like the, you know, top seed who didn't lose his tournament life yet would be able to decide, do I want to ban a map uh, versus do I want to pick it? Uh, but if you pick the starter, it doesn't really matter as much. Uh, cause you're not banning a map as well. So I don't know, like that's one of those cases where maybe the top seed gets to ban a map and pick a starter <laughs> like the, uh, the, and the bottom seed can't do anything, but that's assuming we do best of seven. I haven't decided on that one yet. So essentially we're just switching to double a limb for the playoffs. Now this does mean that we're going to a larger number of games. Like I said, the, we would have had half the number of games. Basically, um, we would have had seven matches uh, before where we would have had the four quarters, the two semis and the, and the finals. But now that we have a double limb, we are looking at 14 matches. Uh, we could do a, a second 
final match or whatever, there's like a, a rule where it's like, because you, you haven't lost your tournament life yet, if you qualify to the grand finals without losing, and then you lose the grand finals, you play another grand finals essentially <laughs> because that was your tournament life. I'm not doing that. So we're just going to have one match of grand finals. That's why we have 14 instead of 15 matches. So uh, since we have double the matches that we would have had with single them, we are going to try to cast all of these matches from replays unless we have, say, an example where it's like we can cast the winner's semifinals back to back because of availability. Okay, then maybe we'll do all of that live. But the replays are going to be a big deal uh, because there's still the potential for them to desync. Like we don't know, we haven't seen that in a long time. So I don't know. Like, I guess that's not exactly true because when Scholar was playing and Scholar has some like network in like sensitivities or something where he just like has some instability in his network, his match with Shambler did actually desync in the replay. And I, I feel like that was one where he was just lagging out uh, because he's actually had issues like that in the past. So with Scholar specifically, we might need to cast him live just because of that. Um, but the other thing that we thought about was maybe, I mean, that's assuming Scholar makes it to playoffs. I think he will, but we'll see about that. Uh, and then, yeah, so there was that. Um, in the event that there's a desynced replay, one of the things that I was hoping to be able to do was uh, have somebody who would volunteer to watch the like spectate and and record like record their FP vod of just the the action, and they would observe the action as best they could, and um, see what happens from there. And we would use that as our emergency video to cast over if need be, uh, similar to how at some point. Um, Mask had to spec had to cast a like finish the cast of a two v two from like my stream POV or something uh, when I was spectating it live. So something like that basically uh, is what we're going to need to do. Uh, so that is the fallback plan. But that's assuming we can get somebody who is not myself or Mask because we want to not be spoiled on the outcome of these playoff series. We want to make sure that we don't have that issue. So I guess realistically, it would just be nice to not have to worry about that. But we don't know what's causing that. And it does seem to be like limited to network instability specifically. But we don't want to have to like worry about that. We don't want that to be like an issue. So, yeah, I mean, I don't know how to exactly attack that. So we'll have to wait and see on that one. Uh, but the other benefit to casting from replays assuming we don't actually, you know, need exhaustive teams deployed to, um, you know, like have a referee or whatever, uh, watching it that way is there's less opportunity for Canada moments as mess calls them. There's less lag potential because you have less connected clients. So in, you know, default Starcraft or whatever, um, like obviously in the format that we previously did where we casted all of them live, what we would see is like, you've got to send your data, you've got to sync up your, your packets and stuff to, uh, myself and to mask in addition to your opponent. And that obviously can result in me needing to set it to extra high latency every time, which obviously is not great for responsivity. So it, we could see an, a level up in terms of the actual play between the players if we, you know, reduce the number of connected clients, even just by one. Uh, and, you know, DF's internet, I think, is pretty reasonable. So, like, if he was going to be the uh, the person, for example, just like throwing a random person's name out there, um, or, you know, maybe Veek is available for, like, a specific case or whatever. Like, I don't know. Like, maybe we could do something like that where we could have a ref. Uh, and if you're interested in being a ref, by the way, uh, maybe you're even, like, it's not your series, but you're uh, you're a player and you've made it. Like, maybe Shambler or something like that. I don't know. Like, if you're interested in that sort of thing, just recording your, uh, your local, like, FP VOD or whatever of you witnessing the game as fallback in case we do require that yeah let me know because that would be massively helpful for this because i do think on the flip side the outcome of this is if we cast from replays and assuming the replays just work and there's no issues at all and we don't even need to use the fp vods from the refs i would like to see a case where um basically we can do all of the quarterfinals back to back so we would do one stream where we go through the the replays from all four quarterfinals as to start off playoffs and then like the next stream would be the first round of the losers bracket which would be the you know lower basically like the losers of the quarterfinals face off against each other there's two series there and then we would maybe do the winners of the quarterfinals uh in that same stream so we'd still do four series and then we would get to a point where the um, the final, I guess the third stream of playoffs would be the round two of the losers bracket. So it's like whoever lost the, uh, semifinals faces off against whoever won the first round of losers. And then the, I guess like, so we do those two matches and then maybe we would do the winners finals 
and those the third round of losers. And then our last stream would be losers finals to decide who meets whoever won uh, in the grand finals and then the actual grand finals itself, right? So we'd have four streams where they would be four matches, four matches, uh, four, yeah, four more matches. So like through the first three streams would be four matches each. And then the final stream would be the, basically like the consolidation final and the gr actual grand final. Uh, so there'd be two matches there for the final one. That could be pretty cool. I mean, that could be pretty hype. So I'm interested in seeing that. Maybe we can pull that off. Uh, but you know, first we got to get through groups and we'll have plenty of time to I ideate on this process, but that's sort of like the pitch, I guess you could say for what is going to happen with the format updates and how we're going to be approaching casting it a little bit differently and the whole ref idea, um, which hopefully isn't even necessary at all, uh, but we have it if we need it. And that is that that's Ascension five. That's the, uh, updates that I'm planning and pretty exciting stuff in my opinion. The only other thing that I can think of to bring up here is that obviously we are continuing to spread the word about the project and get a little bit more uh, information from people. The last couple of days when I came home from work, I would see Gypsy streaming and I'd pop into his chat and invariably uh, a couple of times, you know, we did talk a little bit about CMBW uh, and just comment on different things and stuff. Um, and the second time yesterday, I was, Redmond was actually there and Redmond has been playing the project recently. He's one of the new faces that I mentioned earlier. and. He, I was like, yeah, Redmond had all of his bio, his, his bio ball killed by three Zerg units. That's the CMBW experience or something. And Redmond was like, yeah, it's true. And Gypsy was like, dude, Redmond played? Dude, maybe we're all going to play CMBW. Dude, maybe that's the future. Maybe we'll all play Cosmonarchy or whatever. I don't know. It was interesting to think about it, though. Like, I don't know what to do about Gypsy. I have no idea. I'm not saying he's not trustworthy. I'm just saying I don't really know him. So I have no idea if I should take him at his word exactly. Uh, but it's an interesting idea to imagine him just popping in and being like, yeah, I guess I'll just watch your, you know, I guess I'll just play your, uh, your, your, your mod, your project on stream or whatever. Um, so anyway, there's a bunch of ideas that I have for like, uh, well, actually, I, we'll save that because in the coffee section, there is actually a question about this from none other than Veek7 himself. So hold that thought and we'll come back to that. And I guess we could just cover the coffee questions now. So again, if you are an interested fan, if, a viewer, a uh, player of Cosmonarchy Brood War or our work in general in the RTS space, if you're new here from maybe Ross's Neck of the Woods, from Accursed Farms, or from, you know, these foreign Brood War streams that we've been doing outreach on, or if you found the video or whatever and you're interested in supporting the content, supporting the grind that we're doing, you can absolutely go ahead and do that financially, if you're interested, over on the coffee page, that is co-fee.com forward slash pronogonveek7. Of course, there's always a link in the description. Make it easier on yourself. You can donate up to $3, uh, well, sorry, you can donate in $3 in increments is the idea, uh, although you don't have to do it that many times. You can do it like 20 or whatever. But if you wanted to do uh, that on a monthly basis, then you'll be able to ask us questions. And based on that, you'll be able to get those answered. So let's start off with Luciferius's question. Luciferius, he will be making his competitive debut in Ascension 5. He's a homie. He's going to build a lot of the new Goliath. He likes the new Goliath. He says, if you were to add a fourth race to CMBW, how would you reconcile it with your modded lore? Well, the only reason that's an if and not a when is because we need to figure out if we can crack the code on this iScript extension. If we can do that, you can expect at least one more race being added. Uh, obviously, that's a big, you know, a tall order, a, uh, a big statement, because we have like, what, 80 units per race or something absurd. So adding, well, I mean, it's not that many, but I'm thinking combining structures, maybe it actually is pretty close to it. I never, I, I stopped adding, you know, I stopped counting a long time ago, but, you know, I think the final count for, um, Oh shit, yeah, what is that? Anyway, it's 5, 10, 13, 14. So it's 14 units just for the tier one for Terran as an example. Um, and then 15 if you add the Talos from tier two and then you have what, five, six, six. Oh my God, dude, there's a lot of units per race. I don't know, man, that just in terms of units alone, you're talking about like 50, I think, per race. And then there's the buildings, right? So actually 80 is probably maybe even a conservative estimate um, per race. So, okay, just put a pin in that. Uh, but yeah, so I would need graphics and et cetera for 80 new units. Well, fuck me, I guess, but we'll, we'll make it happen somehow. Um, so yeah, the, anyway, that'll be something to think about when we, if we crack the iScript extender, because I would love to do that. I would love to add a fourth race to CMBW, uh, but definitely something that we need uh, technical expertise dedicated for a while on. That seems like something that maybe like Dark and Fantasies could do, but he he's not, 
Like, I don't, I don't want to just have it be only him doing shit like selection extension, unit limit, entity limit extension, height extension, etc. It's like, can this guy maybe work on his own stuff every now and then? I don't know. Like, I guess he does do that. But I just, I would feel kind of shitty if I was like, hey, man, uh, so you've done all this phenomenal stuff that really sets the project apart. <laughs> you want to go ahead and do something uh, that's even more ridiculous. Like, I might as well ask this guy to extend the resolution of the game or something. It's ridiculous. Anyway, <laughs> that's that's neither here nor there, but I, ha I figured I had to mention it. Um, if we get that cracked, then we can add the fourth race. So then if we do add the fourth race, the premise of Luciferius's question is, how would I reconcile it with the modded lore? I will answer that after a sip. So, uh, sipping is complete. The lore for Cosmonarchy Brood War is that they are in a very far away sector from Caprulu, and it's been some amount of time away from, you know, those events of StarCraft 1, if they even happened at all. It's kind of left deliberately ambiguous because we don't have any reference to Ire or the Overmind or any of the characters from the original game and story. Uh, any of the, like, there's no reference to things like Caprulu Sector. There's no reference to things like the Guild Wars, the Confederacy, none of the nations, etc. right? It's entirely completely separate. And that's basically just to give me carte blanche to write whatever the fuck I want and explain away all the new technologies and all this other stuff. So... I don't really think I need to do too much to reconcile it, if you think about it. It's like, I can just matter-of-factly state that there have been skirmishes with the, what, insert new race name here. And, you know, I was, like, in the past, I've talked about adding the Escozi, which is a uh, one of the member nations of the Ember Seat. Uh, if I imagine something like that, like, I'd probably rename them just for the sake of, like, sort of like a... Uh, Covering all my bases in case Lard is like, hey, you used this in a mod for StarCraft and that's our intellectual property because of our EULA. Um, yeah, I don't think they would, but it would be nice to uh, not need that. So I'd probably not call them Escozi, but for now we can just imagine that like there's some Terrans that discuss the intrusions of the Escozi or like, we got ran out by the Escozi. We had to come back over here or something, you know, something like that. It's like, all right, well, they're just commenting on something. And then maybe like one of the responses or whatever is like, fucking hate those lizards and, and and then they leave it at that for now it's sort of like the um cut dialogue line from phoenix that references some i think it's like some fucking vampire race that the protoss fought a while ago uh, there was something like that that they ended up cutting out of the starcraft one campaign uh for the first protoss mission but uh I, I think they're Tagal or something like that. I can't remember the name off the top of my head, but it's something like that anyway. And so I, I can sort of matter-of-factly represent that, uh, ideally without it sounding like I'm fucking lard dialogue where I'm just like t expositing shit. But definitely something that I'm interested in potentially doing uh, is, you know, at least alluding to that. I mean, I'm going to allude to that even if we don't end up making it because... I like the idea that I can at least establish that the, you know, neighboring sectors are home to other aliens and sectors are so mind bogglingly vast that you might never even encounter them. And obviously if we do end up extending iScript, you can imagine that the Escozi will arrive or whatever the fuck I rename them to. Or maybe I go a different direction entirely with regardless, regarding which race of aliens that I add or something like that. So... I think it's important to mention, this is all very, you know, hypothetical. It's all very like, oh, I don't know if we can do that, but it would be really nice to add another race. I, th I have so many ideas for gameplay and stuff. Uh, maybe if, if there's any questions about that, that might be something I discuss in the next episode of this show, but definitely uh, how would I reconcile it? I feel like I've already given myself carte blanche to do that based on the other things that I did to make the rest of the story and the the setting and stuff of CMBW make sense, right? With the whole Chrysillian sector being completely different, uh, having access to all of this advanced technology that was never in the original games, like, a, you know, Lazarus Agent being time travel, uh, fucking you know, all of the stuff that the Demiurge provides in terms of its power um, and the way that tyranny works and stuff. And like, you know you get to see these sort of mutations, if you want to call them that, like evolutionarily speaking, of the different technologies that are that are out there, right? So anyway, I think that's pretty cool. Uh, personally, I feel like we're in a pretty good spot when it comes to stuff like that uh, because I don't really feel like it would, you know, pop anybody's suspension of disbelief if, you know, as long as I present it kind of matter-of-factly, then they're going to know that this is just a common thing and I'm not presenting it like, oh my God, the big reveal, they're here. Isn't it so amazing and epic? It's like, well, it is pretty epic, but it's also not a requirement. You know what I mean? Like, hopefully that made sense anyway. It's like, it's not, um, it's, it's cool precisely because 
it's another thing in the setting, uh, as opposed to it being this like shocking revelation. Uh, so hopefully that made sense. And thanks for your question, dude. Thanks for making me think about the wonders of having a fourth race in CMBW and seeing like an Escozi main go up against a Terran player and like, you know, all the different cool things that you might see. And then having Gypsy or somebody else be like, that's it. I'm switching to this new race because it's epic or whatever. And then, you know, all this other stuff. So thank, thanks for that, dude. Appreciate it. The Shambler asks, if you had to make a TV show about the life of a civilian in Onatar's setting, how would you go about making it interesting? So... I haven't actually decided if mankind has quote unquote civilians. I was thinking about maybe taking a page out of the sort of starship troopers approach where they kind of like all are, even the, the non-combatants are still like members of the war machine, so to speak. I feel like that's kind of an interesting idea to go about. If you really imagine that you've been at wartime for so long that it's affected generations upon generations of, of people. And the wartime is not just, you know, world wars between humans. I mean, well, that's kind of like a meta commentary, I guess I'll refrain from commenting too much on that, but it's like in, in Onatar's setting, you could imagine that that's just like generationally speaking, they are aware of all of that. Right. And they would have their own sort of, if you want to call it propaganda, you could about like, uh, how to, you know, train your, your, you from a young age to condition you to, to not fear the unknown, but instead maybe hate it or whatever. Uh, that could definitely be an interesting thing to think about. Although I wouldn't want them to come off cartoonish, um, but definitely, you know, having the, the ambient temperature, I guess, of, of mankind be slated towards not liking the other, um, and, and being slated towards you know, trying to be in fiercely territorial in that sense, uh, laying claim to stuff like that, uh, would definitely be something that would be on their mind. Um, so anyway, your question, it's not, not to say your question doesn't make any sense. Cause again, I haven't decided if there's going to be civilians or not, but you know, I could imagine a TV show. My, okay. Here's another aside. I don't understand like sitcom approaches to TV shows where I guess the idea is that it just can run on indefinitely and you never need a, a decided conclusion. Like to me, a uh, series, right? A serial, uh, which is sort of like what a TV show is. Uh, but you know, that's like the global term for when they're not on TV anymore. Cause you watch them on Netflix or whatever. Um, so a serial is like, to me, it's best when it has a point to make and it only needs a season or a couple seasons or whatever to make that point. And then like the characters sort of have their arcs and reach their conclusions, be they written out of the story by death or some other reason, but they like come to a conclusion, right? And then, you know, you kind of move on uh, to some other art form, right? That you want to make. And the other people move on to like other arts, the, uh, other art forms that the, or art uh, pieces or whatever that they want to consume and, and engage with and all this other stuff. So my, my idea of a serial would probably be like, here's, you know, your first look at what mankind is like when you're not on the front lines. Um, what, be, what, what, what the life is when you're just, a just another human, you know, um, and like what the goals would be. And we'd probably follow some guy who ends up being say, you know, a frontline soldier, um, has like a very naive idea of what, uh, war might be like. Uh, but maybe he has some way to ground that against, you know, I, I mean, ideally because Onatar's setting is about the human condition, it would be really cool if we could, have a character, a couple, a couple of characters in particular, um, almost like an externalization of the temptation to abandon earthly roots and go towards, say, you, you might have like a character that might be infatuated with technological progress, and maybe they are um, like the excess, the externalized example or idea of the pull towards where entropic go. Uh, versus, you know, staying with mankind, right? And, you know, you imagine he might have a love interest that uh, keeps him anchored towards mankind. And then there might be like a, 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 a grizzled veteran leader who tries to, you know, a act as like the, the the father figure or whatever, this the wise old sage and stuff like that, right? Uh, so I might like start off by building up this set of, some of them are kind of tropey, but generally like these elements that would be the, the central characters. And then those central characters, while they would have their own arcs and own interesting things, would also help to represent the human condition of, 
I want to grow and do more things and be better, but I want, I, I have to find a way to navigate life and be better in a way that, or, you know, grow or whatever, in a way that doesn't betray what I am and who I am and, and what I come from, uh, and, and like something core to my person. And I feel like that would probably be the, the main thrust of that. Now, would he become a soldier? Would he become a, a commander or whatever? Like, I feel like you'd probably need something like that. So I don't know if that betrays the premise of the question by saying it's a civilian. Again, I feel like there's only so much you could do as a civilian to be interesting, but not just interesting, but like to have a point. And so I think I would want to explore that human condition part. Um, like, would he, I, I don't know. Like if he was not able to be in the military at all, would he find a way to, I don't know, like would he suspect somebody of being a, a, a secret blood summon plant, you know, an agent, you know, something like that, right? Sleeper cell or, or whatever. Um, would he, would he suspect uh, like, you know, I don't know, this local um, machine shop runner to be, uh, you know, a secret entropic beacon automaton. I don't, I don't think that kind of stuff works because that's not really how the setting works. Like they're much more about like RTS level scale in terms of military action. And uh, not to say that they don't maybe have stuff like that, but it would be a bit odd. Um, maybe, maybe you could have a civilian that has lived on a particular, um, you know, a world with a functioning uh, or dormant, perhaps uh, obsidian for a long time. The obsidians being the things that control the, I guess the planetary nature, the form, the weather, et cetera, the climate, um, all this, all this stuff about like the aspects of the, of the obsidian, maybe the obsidian was dormant for a long time and something activated it. Maybe the civilian is actually responsible for that in some way or contributed to that activation. And the first thing that happens is like, uh, you know, voiceless invasion or, you know, that, that draws the ire of nearby blood summon or whatever. Like it, it makes, it creates the attention, you know, it, it, you know, something like that. Right. And then you'd have something like that work out where then mankind show up and they, I don't want to use the word gentrify, but they, you know, they take over the place. They transform it, transfigure it into something that it wasn't before, that it was much more of a civilian idea. It was almost idyllic maybe. Um, and that naivete is like shattered that youth or that uh, innocence is like paved over to make way for military bases. And maybe he's even conscripted or something. I don't know. You could probably do something like that, I guess, if you wanted to, to have the military part, not be like, it, it, you know, it's still central to the story, but it's not his wish necessarily. Um, you know, he's just forced to try to defend his home and maybe he wants to defend it from mankind too, because they're fucking taken over, you know, the military or whatever. Uh, obviously he is a human. So it's weird to say defend from mankind, but like the mankind forces that show up there, right. Um, the local nation and stuff like that. So I don't know. It's interesting to think about stuff like that, but yeah, that would be a tough one. So hopefully that question gave you something though, and, uh, gave you some information about what Onatar is all about. I definitely like the idea of maybe it being a, a dormant, uh, obsidian, uh, so maybe we could, maybe we could work with that. Yeah. Mirian asks what Shambler asked, but for Zabalba. So basically if I had to make a serial about the life of a civilian in Zabalba setting, so he didn't specify which Regency. Uh, so I don't know if he's like assuming by default, it would be Ansifi. Uh, although knowing Mirian, he'd probably be interested in whichever, um, Regency that I asked or that I answered this question with. Uh, so uh, a civilian, um, I don't know. Like, so he, so Mirian is aware of the plan for the Psychora campaign, which has a bit of a draft up already. And that Psychora campaign is basically the Daybreak Guild, which is this embassy uh, sort of arrangement. You could say that, that, that it also made a, uh, an arrangement, a business proposal to a, uh, an Ansifi mercenary group, a mercenary fleet, uh, called the Santa sons. Uh, those two are sort of like prospecting, right? And they're they're harvesting a bunch of resources. And the Sykora show up to take control of these resources for their own home, you know, their home dimensions war effort. And they basically instantly turn the place upside down. Uh, Daybreak Guild sends this distress signal out. It ends up getting intercepted by a studious, uh, an opportunistic Macrolon empire that, uh, you know, one of the agents of which uh, decides to arrive earlier than expected from the rest of them instead of staying with the the sort of staying with everybody else. So the kid who reads ahead in class kind of vibe, he shows up early with the idea that if he can, you know, defeat them himself uh, that, and he, or he can even establish a foothold that ends up being useful, then he can, you know, lay a stake a claim towards the throne eventually, right? He can use this as like a political machination or whatever. That's like going back to how the Macrolon operate. And 
during all of this, I mean, this is eventually, you know, going to inspire the Githrovans to try to interfere and, and stop this fighting. And can't we come to some kind of peaceful conclusion? And then they get roped into the military action. And so, you know, it's, I can't, I can't remember exactly if the Githrovans show up first or not. I think, uh, they probably do. Uh, and then the Macrolons show up afterwards because the, the Githrovan take special, um, exception to Sykora incursions, considering they don't even come from the same dimension. So the Githrovans generally try to monitor for that kind of thing. Uh, so that they are, they arrive earlier than the Macrolons do, and the Macrolons only arrive because of the distress signal from the Daybreak Guild. That way, it's like it's not like the Githrovans intercepted the Daybreak Guild's transmission and then sent, were sent to help, and then I use that again as the reason for why the Macrolons show up because uh, I felt like that would be a little bit stupid. But it also just makes sense when you think about like what the Githroven are trying to do. Of course, they would want to stop extra dimensional intrusions into their universe, right? That's that that would be a pretty big important part about commencement is that you don't have interlopers from other dimensions just walking in and rocking up and screwing up your shit. So, uh, yeah. Anyway, the reason I'm premise, I'm giving you the guys, the premise of one of the campaigns is because I was actually kind of interested when I read this question in like, what would an Ember Sethi, like say an Escozi, since they came up earlier, what would an Escozi civilian think? Like he's just over here trying to make an honest living mining for the daybreak guild. And you know, then this shit happens to him and he has to suddenly, uh, pick up the, the rifle instead of the prospector pick or whatever, you know, like the, I'm using, they don't literally mine with picks, but you know what I mean? Like he's got to equip a rifle to his, his, uh, mining suit or something like that. You know, I don't know. That's kind of interesting to think about because I, I like the idea of the fish out of water scenario for these civilians, because I feel like even if they're briefed ahead of time on like what kinds of threats might occur, Sykora are pretty exotic anyway. And the idea that you would be prepared for that kind of intrusion just out of nowhere is pretty unlikely. So that alone instantaneously communicates to the audience that like, oh, this is not something that happens all the time. So that would be an interesting like premise for a uh, serial is this guy who, you know, gets shipped off and maybe he's, he's been here for a little bit. Like we could have some elements of the Escozi character being, I mean, we could do like, there's like a, you could probably do any of the, the basic races of the, uh, Ember Seat, but I'm picking Escozi cause I, they came up earlier. Um, you, you imagine he, he wakes up, he's been here for maybe a couple months or something, standard months or whatever. And so like, you can tell that he's been here for a while. Cause we have that as like the grounding, like this is normal for him. And then one day the Sykora show up and they're like all these you know, air raids or whatever. And like, you know, get, you know, get to safety, pull back, whatever. And they're th he's thinking, what is this some kind of drill? But like, everybody seems a little bit more hurried and, and maybe stoic or something than normal instead of being like, you know, annoyed. They're like actually worried some of the, like the guards and stuff. And then that, that's like the indication that like, Oh, maybe something is actually happening. And that that's the inciting incident for his, uh, you know, trying to stay alive, basically. That, that would be more of a survival story, I think. Uh, the Sykora show up, the Githroven show up, the Makraldas show up. Like, it just gets, it goes from, uh, some, from, okay, whatever, this is a little bit grinding work, but I'm doing it, honest day's labor or whatever, into total fucking chaos very quickly. So I feel like that would be an interesting premise. That's the th first thing that comes to mind. Um, but there would also have to be like a higher point to it. Like, what is the what is there, what are the sort of like the the moral of the story I guess um you know this guy may, like maybe we would have to dig up his backstory we'd have to think about our Escozi protagonist's backstory like why is he mining for the daybreak guild is he doing it entirely of volition it doesn't seem like a job that you would take unless you were already a little bit desperate and maybe we could like you know really show that based on the um, surly nature of the Escozi uh they are pretty like quick to anger as a species uh, but they also flame their anger out a little very quickly. So that like, I don't know, it, it's, they can balance that. Uh, but anyway, having some information about them would be cool. Like about the characters specifically, like, why is he doing it? Is he sending the money back home somewhere? Who knows? Right. Um, and then, you know, has to fight just for his, for his own life, let alone for the ability to continue earning a living, uh, to everybody else for everybody else. And then, you know, maybe he could try to, uh, he would have to somehow work his way into the, maybe into the command structure, not in the sense of him leading armies, but in the sense of him making pivotal decisions um, to, yeah, you know, imagine something like that. I don't know. I'm not sure exactly how that would work out, but that, that would be an interesting idea. Finding a way to make that work so that the meta narrative establishes a moral and like a broader point um, and provide some interesting arguments or ideas. And then at the same time, we get to explore 
how the Daybreak Guild is coping with the sudden arrival of all of these. And like eventually the Santa Sons just get the fuck out of there because th- this is not worth the money that they're being paid despite the handsome sum. Uh, it's not worth potentially being dominated by Makaldas or, you know, stasis by Githroven or uh, obviously just killed by the Sykora. So they're just out. Uh, and that leaves them at a really tough loss. Like maybe he has an opportunity to escape with the Santa sons or something. And he chooses to stay behind for some reason. That could be something that happens at, like towards the season finale, uh, like maybe the penultimate episode or something. I don't know. So yeah, there's a, there's an idea. Anyway, a couple ideas there. Sip time. So Veek asks, will you host a CMBW tournament in which Brood War pros will play? Yeah, so I think if none of the Brood War pros check us out by Ascension 6, which uh, for those keeping track, if we're going to stick to the two-week schedule, is going to be the 14th of October. It's actually the day after my birthday, so that's pretty cool. Uh, If we can bang out Ascension 6 and we get some pros signed up, then this answer probably won't apply, but maybe it will anyway. But if that doesn't happen, then I will actually just reach out to a lot of the pros that already know about me and know about the project and say, I'm going to host a tournament, $100 prize pool, um, each, you know, like the, you know, it's a, it's a single group, like maybe we grab one Protoss main, one Terran main, one Zerg main. We tell them to get into the, into a single Ascension group. And we just say, you know, each win is $10. Uh, and then, you know, just see what happens. I mean, maybe it wouldn't even need to be a hundred dollars, right? Is that uh, under normal Ascension groups rules? Winner stays on no matter what. So it would be something like, even if somebody goes like seven and O or whatever, they, you know, depending on, I think it's usually they, they play nine games in a n- normal situation. So if you go, if you have somebody who goes nine and O, then that would be a case where it's like, okay, well you need at least a second place decider. <laughs> so there'd be a 10th game played. Uh, but I don't think it would be something like that. Like maybe that would be something we could do once a month. Maybe is like a, just a single group type of tournament where it exists outside the confines of the season. So you don't, um, you don't play for season points. You just play for an actual prize purse. And that would be specifically like I'm inviting, you know, I don't know, uh, Gypsy for Terran and DeWalt for Protoss. And who would I invite for Zerg? I mean, Urban's a, a level below a lot of those guys. I guess I could maybe think about Striker or who's the who's the best Zerg in Foreign Brew where maybe it's Hawk, Hawk or Striker, probably one of those two. So I, I would check those guys out and probably be like, hey, dude, you want in? Uh, but anyway, I take a look at some of the other options. Uh, and, and, you know, we could theoretically do bigger, like depending on the dedicated prize purse for that tournament, which I would have to put up some. But I could see a world where we run, you know, two Ascension groups that are like that. And then we get into the, uh, like a, a playoffs between the, the group winners uh, and the second placers. Uh, similar to how the current set of playoffs works. So something like that could be interesting. I don't know. But I'll at the very least have like enough money probably to throw around for that purpose, right? And the reason why we have a little bit of prize money, even if though it's like $10 a match or whatever, um, like $10 a win, I mean, is because that's already something that happens with sponsored matches in Brood War. Like the prize purse doesn't have to be high for to catch the attention of these guys. And, you know, that gives us a little bit of legitimacy. And then if it's just, it's actually pros, then okay, suddenly it's like, oh, this is pretty cool. Ideally, we can convince them to do that without needing to do that uh, prize pool version. Because if they can check it out because they're actually interested and maybe because they want to check out like the season, uh, season point stuff, like they re- realize we've got money that way then that that's fine because that that's actually preferable since then we're not establishing the precedent that pros only played this because of the money. Um, but at the same time, if we like use that as the excuse to break the ice and then they try it, then they might, ch- they might just check it out all the time. Uh, but I, I have a sneaking suspicion that, but before my birthday, uh, before the 14th of October for Ascension six, even if we don't get them to sign up for that tournament, I think gypsy might check it out and play it. On his stream, I think maybe DeWalt will do the same. I don't know if he'll do it on stream, but like he might check it out. Who knows, dude? Like, it's possible. There's a lot. Of, a lot of things are possible. But thanks for your question, homie. Obviously, Veek is not like a subscriber or whatever to our own coffee page, but he gets a question. You know, the, the no frauds, the not frauds get questions if they have them. It's pretty rare that they do it, and these episodes aren't super long anyway. Ben Tabersky asks, would there ever be a point that CMBW is too big or small for you to put effort into the community building aspect that you've been doing? 
Well, I think it's definitely right to say that the community building aspect takes time and effort and energy because it requires me to, I mean, I watch StarCraft streams anyway, so that's not really energy, but like I have to pay a lot of attention and I have to like engage and like find ways to not be an asshole about commenting on like this thing. Like, like it has to be organic, right? So like if there's a bug on the screen that's really obvious, it's like, oh man, I'm glad we fixed that in CMBW or something, you know, like whatever. Even that is a little bit fucking asshole <laughs> in my opinion. I'm, I'm not super comfortable like, you know, shilling my own shit, but even that is a little bit much. But like if I can find out even a less ex exhaustive way, like usually I just end up asking like, what would you change if, if you had to? Or, you know, is there something that stands out to you that is like a problem in Brood War that you'd like to see fixed? Or if, do you think that there's a way to improve Brood War or whatever? I ask them these interesting questions because even if they don't end up checking out CMBW or even if CMBW doesn't come up in that kind of conversation, I feel like it's still potentially useful for CMBW and for my RTS projects in general because now I'm getting a high la like high level ladder players opinion or pro player amateur players opinion on the game state on how brood war works and on like what's up with starcraft in general like how like what might be what their opinions are about good rts stuff and yeah a lot of the times their opinions are not going to be in line with my vision uh, or at least like that's certainly a possibility but knowing that that kind of feedback or thought process is out there is actually very useful like I don't think it's a good idea to cater towards the esports crowd and like try to make a game specifically for pro players. I think what you do is you try to make a good game and then the players will come. Uh, like the, the, the players will, you know, create this grassroots scene, sort of like how CMVW has worked, where we have people who don't have a background in pro play who are winning tournaments and, you know, eventually more and more people are checking it out. Like that's pretty much how you would do it. The players will show up if it's a good enough thing and you get the eyes on it, right? So I'm not really worried about it in that in that sense. Uh, but yeah, it, it does require effort to do this community building. It does require the idea that we are actively making these videos, for example, to sort of like market the project, if you want to call it that, to distill some of the essence of the project into, you know, a sub 10 minute video or the, this aspect of the project has to be distilled into a sub 10 minute video. Uh, stuff like that is an interesting challenge. It does require a lot of time. You know, the time that I'm spending on these videos could have been spent on tutorial content or, you know, um, modeling or whatever, like any insert anything here. Uh, it could have been spent on actual content production or project development instead of being spent on, you know, essentially marketing or advertising or whatever you want to call that. And I don't think, you know, would it ever get too small for me to do that? I mean, maybe... Like if we went back to not having games every day, um, if we went back to it being like very rare that we see project like games happen and we don't get enough signups to do, you know, three to four groups of Ascension um, every other week, you know, we might even go to a once a month type thing anyway, if the tournament itself gets bigger. Like if we, if we imagine like, we get eight grid like okay. This, let's go the other way and say it gets really big. We have eight groups. Okay, well the first four groups are going to be one Saturday, and then the next Saturday will be the next four groups, and then we'll do playoffs a week later. Uh, and and uh, you know playoffs might be like uh, maybe we can bang them out all in one week or whatever. But um, after that, then we have like a week off before the next tournament, right? So that would seem sensible at that point if we have to do it that way. Uh, but anyway, uh, what I'm getting at here is. I think uh, the project could get small enough to the point where maybe interest is passed and we can dedicate our efforts on, you know, building a new game and stuff like that and see if we can start the cycle all over again. I don't really think it will, though. Like, it seems pretty self-sustaining. We get new people in. We, like, a lot of the people who are interested have been interested for a very long time. So there's not really, like, turnover in that sense. Um, occasionally, you'll get people who play pretty regularly for a little bit, not in PVP matches, mind you, but in, um, you know, maybe they'll play AI matches like Rainer Earl was around for a while and he, he doesn't seem to play it too much. Um, but like generally speaking, the people who play in play in PVP matches and tournaments, I guess the beaver hasn't played in a bit, but he's been making maps for the project. So it's not like he's inactive in the, in the project. Um, has there been anybody else who's signed up and then not like he's actually actively participating. I guess Mesk doesn't play, but he casts. So again, it's sort of like the Beaver. Uh, DF is still contributing to the project and even said that he could sign up as a reserve player for this coming tournament. So it's like, I don't think we have people who are not interested in the project after trying it to the point where they're competing in tournaments at the very least. So that is pretty clearly like a, a, a good thing for the, for the project. It's a good thing for CMBW. 
and it seems like I don't think it'll get small anytime soon. Um, the community building is taxing in a sense that I don't really think that I'm a natural marketer. I don't really like trying to convince people to check it out. I, I prefer just to demonstrate how good it is and then make, let them make their own decision. But in a way, I actually really like the video, making the videos because it's basically me saying to myself, to people in general, like, here's what I've done. Here's the essence of it distilled in a very easy to digest explainer video. Uh, what do you think? You know, what, what are, don't you think this is cool? Like, don't you think this is great? And everybody seems to say yes. Like the, I haven't received negative comments on, uh, any of these videos yet. Right. So I, I, I don't know that I'm sure some people think that the project is dumb, but those people aren't around to contribute to the project. You know, they just abandon ship and that's fine. Like that's their prerogative. And I'm not saying that like, it's good to be in an echo chamber. What I mean by that is it doesn't seem like it's a negative thing at all. Even if we get critique or people not being sure if the project is going in a good direction for them, they can check it out and tell us what they think. And a lot of the people who comment such things, like one of the guys had an ultralist portrait, I think for his avatar, uh, on YouTube. And he commented saying that he wasn't super, super, um, jazzed about the removal of supply and upgrades maybe, or maybe it was RNG. I don't remember. Uh, somebody said that and they were like, yeah, those are my, those are things that I really liked about Starcraft one. It's like, well, you might not like CMBW, but I also think that if you check it out, you might have some more interesting thoughts about that. And if you do check it out, let it, let me know what you think. Let us know what you think. Right. Uh, and that's the only thing that I can say. Right. And if those people are actively playing and contributing and providing, um, you know, different, I, I guess if we think about it, like, you know, we get all of this really exciting stuff done. We provide all of these exciting changes. We improve a lot of things about the base game, in our opinion. Like people will figure that out and they'll decide whether they're gonna to provide feedback, to try it out in the first place, and all that stuff. And the only thing we can do is make it easier and easier to get started. And that's what a lot of that community building stuff has been about, is making these starter videos, the installation guide, the crash courses, stuff like that. And also holding these tournaments and doing these streams. Sometimes I stream just playing games instead of working on development. Like that's also another way for people to not just discover, but learn more about the project because they're literally watching the designer of the project play. As embarrassing as my play actually is. So too big is a weird one because the community builds itself if it's big enough. Too small? Yeah, probably, but I feel like that's not very likely. So hopefully that answered your question, Mr. Biddyby, and see you next time. Three Crow asks, do you see yourself setting an example for alternative scenario content in your own games? And this is our last question, by the way, so we'll close the show out after this. Uh, for example, Brood War and Warcraft 3 were shipped with custom games. Would Antikythera and future titles have your idea of a properly made tower defense map or whatever example you choose? I wouldn't mind dedicating development time to showing off some of the custom things that you can do because I do think that, that that's actually a really interesting angle to provide value for more casual players. But at the same time, uh, recently I played Synthetic 2 with my brother and it's not finished yet, very obviously. And it's pretty, um, the UI is pretty bad and the experience of actually trying to use that UI to do anything is pretty bad. Like you have to double ready up every time and all this other stuff. So it's really obviously not done. But uh, one of the things that they have in that is this mutator setting or whatever, where you basically decide how to, you decide which version of the game you want to play instead of there being a unified version of the game. And I don't, think that custom maps are the same thing as that because you're decidedly not modifying the game. You're playing something very different, but they kind of have a similar vibe where it's like, if there's official content that lets you do X, Y, Z thing that is completely different than the base game, that does kind of feel like an official endorsement of having a completely different game than what we have. And I think it's probably that I, it's probable that I am thinking too deeply about this and it's fine to have a fucking chess map like armies of Exigo had or whatever. But I'm also thinking that maybe it would be best if we just focused really heavily on making a really good game with a lot of content. And then, you know, like if Veek makes a tower defense map or I make a fucking bound or, or something like, okay, maybe then you know, we can package that in, in some very obviously like arcade slash custom section, but it, it doesn't have to be listed as official TNFC content, right? For the No Frauds Club. It doesn't have to, 
like be marked as, you know, some, the equivalent of blizzard official. Um, I, I just feel like it's better to focus on building a complete experience and trying to do one thing really well. And that one thing being everything that the game is about. Right. So hopefully that explains it. Hopefully that's something that uh, makes sense to you because I do think that it's cool to imagine having more things that are completely distinct. Like it's something that realistically speaking is it's, it's kind of not a thing that happens too often in games these days. They don't usually have that. Um, they usually go with the synthetic two approach actually, where it's like totally customize your gameplay experience because we didn't feel like deciding to do one specific thing with our game. It's like, you might prefer a completely different game state. So here's that option. It's like, what the fuck? So I know that was in the, uh, the Metro games as well. Like the the reduxes, you could play those and then you could just like completely change the time to kill and stuff. And when I played that, I didn't have a visceral reaction to it as much as I should have, because really it's, it's quite telling that you would just completely change the game state entirely and then be like, eh, you, this is an option. It's like, bro, that's a completely different experience though. Why would I do that? You know, um, why would I, why, why can't I just rely on you? It's sort of like difficulty levels. Like, why can't I just rely on you to make a good game that is fundamentally sound instead of doing all that? So custom maps to me border on that, but at the same time, I, I don't know. I think it's probably fine to have a couple of things. I would just not mark them as like official content. They would very clearly be custom content that we would have in a custom content folder. So even though they would be made by TNFC staff, they wouldn't be official content in the same way that like the campaigns were, right? So I think that's probably where I come down on that. And that takes us to the show outro. I hope you guys have enjoyed this episode of Prototype. We managed to make it a little bit under 90 minutes. And that is just fine for me. Obviously, a lot of questions this time around. We obviously had a lot of ideas for uh, exciting things like a potential fourth race in CMBW if we fix some internals and extend some internals. Uh, we obviously have the height extension coming up, more maps, more tournaments, uh, attention from the foreign broodwork community. We've got more videos coming, eventually tutorials, etc. I am very pleased with the idea that we can continue to make absolute smashing happen and uh, really redefine in most people's minds what makes a really good RTS game. Uh, ideally, we can continue to provide a high quality experience. We can improve things like AI. We can improve things like the audiovisuals with new models and stuff. Thanks to Solstice for all the stuff he's been doing recently. And yeah, excited to just see where this stuff goes. You know, every day I get to wake up, I get to work a little bit more on this project. I get to see you know more games be played, play some more games myself, uh, see more people's inputs, experiences, ideas on the metagame, on all this other stuff. And I get to just get excited about the, the future, what the future is going to hold, but also the now and, and what a great thing that we've been able to make. So that's my take. That's my perspective. And I'm always interested in the homies over in the No Frauds Club in our Discord server. So if you got your own feedback and you don't want to leave it in the comment section for some reason, well, throw it in there. And I'll three you later, homies. GG.